Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, this is the Planning and Community Development Committee of the SCRD for Thursday, April 11, 2019. And I first acknowledge that we are within the territory of the Seashelt First Nation. Uh, my name is Bill Beamish, right there. I'm the chair of this meeting, and uh, we'll, we have a fairly full agenda. Um, we have one addition to the agenda um, under new business this morning. Uh, Director Seegers has added public engagement on water under new business. Um, we could add that to the agenda. And um, under the delegation, we have uh, Barbara Capel of Urban's Landing, but also um, Mr. David Twentyman is going to speak uh, on the delegation. And um, for the board, um, we have received an insert, item number 10, on your agenda, which is the RFP for the Sunshine Coast Arena Chiller replacement and refrigeration. Everybody got that copy? No? Okay. We could I have a motion, please, to adopt the agenda as amended? Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you. We'll proceed. Um, okay. We're right directly into that delegation. So, Mr. Twentyman, I understand you're going to speak first. Now, delegations, uh, we have a allotment time of 10 minutes for delegations, and then uh, the board will ask questions uh, beyond that 10 minutes. So, so that uh, if you take your full 10, then we will ask questions beyond that. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> good morning, and uh, thank you for allowing us to make this presentation. My name is David Twentyman. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Pender Harbor for the last 28 years, 22 years of which have been in Irvin's Landing. Um, <coughs> During this time, I've also run a business uh, and know and understand the vagaries that exist for businesses on the coast with uh, seasonality and so forth. I'd like to acknowledge the good work of the Lagoon Society that they have done and the impact they've had, positive impact they've had on the whole region and our awareness of the fragile environment that we live in. To start with, I'd like to talk about the background of Irvin's Landing. It was originally uh, the Union Steamship uh, docking point from 1889 up till 1959. There were, over the years, a hotel, a store, post office, boat building, etc. This was a very vibrant area. But with the end of the steamship's visits to Irvin's Landing, it turned basically to a residential area. A pub was built, a marina was built, which serviced the local residents. The pub went through a number of ownerships and eventually was sold to investors who thought they would put in quarter shares. Those quarter shares went through about three different designs, all of which came to naught, and the end result was the marina was sold off, destroyed, removed. The fuel dock that was there was removed. The fueling ability was removed. And the pub went into decline and eventually was closed. And for the last number of years was a ruin. So <clears throat> I hope you'll understand that when I speak, it is with a certain amount of fear and trepidation about another event taking place in our area. I'd like to refer you to Exhibit A, which is a local map, and walk you through, as I believe that most of you are not familiar with the area, so that you have a better understanding of the area. From the top of the map, you will see Irvin's Landing Road coming down. It comes down a steep hill past the uh, exit to Lee Road, then flattens off at the bottom. At Cross Tree Road, there is a slight incline turning left and right, which leads to a blind corner from the point of view that it rises and restricts vision. Cross Tree Road is a dead end. Keelson Road is a dead end. If you come down Urban's Landing Road towards where the proposed site is, Dames Road branches off to the right, 
it too is a dead end, and Urban's Landing Road is a dead end. We have basically 15 houses in the close vicinity of the pod's proposed site. In Exhibit 2, an aerial view gives you a better idea of how these houses are placed as opposed to just a map. And you can see that it is a very closely uh, built up residential area. In the following pages, there are photographs. Exhibit 3 is of the site where the pods are going to be and down Dames Road and Exhibit 4 and 5 and 6 are other regional views of the area. I'm here to represent the neighbors who have some concerns. These concerns are the increase in traffic, the inadequacy of the road infrastructure from Garden Bay Lake, particularly to Urban's Landing, the increase in pedestrian and car traffic on Dames Road, Cross Tree Road, and Keelson Road that is likely to happen, the anticipated and inevitable parking of cars along these residential roads. There's a fear that with the increase of traffic, there will be also a rise in crime. There is also an increased danger to pedestrians who currently walk their dogs around these roads and up the hill and the general area. There is a fear of potential devaluation in our properties. There is, as you will see in Exhibit 6, a large area which is where the proposed auditorium and underground and level ground parking is going to be. This all has to be blasted. According to one of our residents who is in the construction business, he estimates that it is a minimum of at least 20 tandem dump or 40 dump trucks to get rid of all of that, and not to mention the impact it may have on nearby houses. The fact that visitors are having to be bussed in or water taxied in emphasizes to us the unsuitability of this site for a major tourist operation. There's skepticism about the ability to draw conferences to a location where the attendees have to be, uh, rely on being transported to the site and then from the site to where they're going to sleep. Feeling that people today are also used to their transportation and many are just going to drive down to have a look um, <clears throat> and not necessarily avail of the transportation that PODS is saying they are going to have. There's a major concern concerning the financial viability. PODS is a, found, a charitable foundation and they rely 100% on money being donated and or grants. We have been told by PODS in various presentations that construction will only happen when funds are available. This could mean that the construction period will drag on for some number of years. And the fact that they are already saying phase one is the PODS, phase two is the auditorium, um, means that we can look forward to it for years in that area. <clears throat> the residents would, however, support the rezoning if the current designated area, of, which is R2, were to remain R2 and the rest of the area were to be rezoned according to the proposal. This would make the entry area to the facility less of a traffic pedestrian hazard being further away from the exits of Dames Road 
the blind corner and the driveway of lot 32. It would also create more of a buffer zone between what has been for the last 50 years a basically a residential area. The return of a marina to the area would also be an advantage as Pender Harbor is short of boat marinas. We would also seek the support of the SCRD, and I know this may not be in the mandate, to encourage Moti to place speed bumps at the bottom of landing, Urban's Landing Road, the junction of Cross Tree Road, and also on Dames Road, to re-sign Dames Road to residents only, and to the placement of no parking signs in areas all the way around. And placement of a mirror on the blind corner. Thank you. That is our presentation from the residents. Thank you, Mr. Twentyman. Um, would you mind staying for questions, please? Um, first of all, a question I have with Mr. Hall. What is the status of, of this project? Where are we? I assume there will be a public hearing coming up. Yes, Michelle. thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, this particular project and application, we have had two public information meetings to date. We have conducted referrals, and the report on the agenda today does recommend proceeding to public hearing okay. should the committee wish to consider second reading and scheduling of the hearing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So that uh, this will, if it goes through, there will be a public hearing on this as well. So it'll give you another opportunity to present this information. So do you have questions at this time from the, the board for Mr. Twentyman? Okay. Mr. Hiltz, Director Hiltz. Um, yes, th thank, thanks for the um, presentation. I'm interested in uh, the R2, what, what is the, the rationale behind the residents and wanting R2 to be separated out from the, the rest of the parcel? Uh, basically, it has always been residential. There was a house until it burned down. Um, it is basically within the residential area as opposed to being more towards the, the water and where the docks were and so on and so forth. Um, that is the reasoning because it's more in the residential area. It keeps it all part of a residential area as opposed to being right up to the end of the property uh, rezoned as being uh, commercial. So, so that's the buffering aspect that you're yeah. talking about? Oh, okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Twenty. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Capel, I understand you have something to add to this? Good morning. My name is Barbara Capelli, and I live at 4172 Irving's Landing Road. Uh, my house is the one next to the R2 lot, which, uh, upon which it's proposed to construct this uh, humongous conference center. My house is uh, basically grandfathered in because it's only about between three and four meters from the road. It used to be the old community hall, so it dates from probably the 1920s, um, and there's a lot of... Uh, information in our local history books about what, what happened in that hall and the, the uh, dances and things that used to happen there. This house was changed, into, uh, this hall was changed into a house and we bought the property um, approximately a little more than 20 years ago, at which time it was just a, a kind of a barn structure. And during the t intervening years, we've upgraded the property so that we it more or less fits in with the other houses in the area, most of which have um, um, sea view, sea view or, or on the seashore, so they're very much more expensive than our house would have been. The houses, we are, we are located on a hill, as I said, but only about four meters from the road. The other houses on the hill from the top of the, the top of Hotel Lake are all located on the, the back on their lots, so they have 
views over the trees out into the inlets and out into the, the Bay Area. My house does not because we're so much further down. My view is to this due south along my south property line, which gives me a, only the only view I have, which is onto the inlet. The proposal to construct this conference center would put a blank wall um, almost as high as my house. My house is 27 feet tall, but the upstairs, the upstairs deck um, is approximately 10 feet from the, so it would be 20, under 20 feet. And this building as listed shows that there will be a blank wall along the property line. So I will have no view at all. There has been an accommodation made, if you look in your papers here. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not as stated in this map. I stood there yesterday. All I can see is the roadway. As David already mentioned, this house was, is, has an R2 designation. And it's always been a, a, a thought that there would be another house built on there on the top of the lot, the same as the previous one, which was, which was used to house the manager of the uh, restaurant. So what I'm saying is that um, I do not want that R2 lot changed um, because it really impacts me. It will be right in front of any view that I have left. Um, the shading from that wall all the way along the lot will mean that I have to um, change my garden, which is right now it's a full sun's garden, but it, it won't be once that building is put up. So I would like consideration be given to not changing the designation of that lot in view of the fact that um, I don't think that there is an opportunity for a very much conference business. It also prevents the local area from benefiting from the any meeting rooms that need to be need to be rented. We have a, a nice a school hall at the top of the hill, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from this um, location, which could be used by the pods people uh, for meetings. There's also three locations in Madeira Park, just 10 minutes up the inlet from where this location is. Um, there's a music school, there's a, co a community hall, and there's also a legion all of which would really benefit from any interest that PODS would have in, in promoting uh, tourism and uh, help the local restaurants up there. So basically, I'm asking you to not change the, the zoning on the R2 part. Thank you, Ms. Capelli. Um, questions uh, from the board? Time. Okay. See none, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. We'll now move into reports. And first of all, I'd like a, um, a motion to receive all of the reports that are on today's agenda. Moved and seconded. All in favor, receive the reports. Thank you. Uh, first report. Now, this is the first report. We'll deal with this uh, uh, project that we've just been speaking to and uh, invite the senior planner to uh, introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Bimish. Um, so following the first reading of the bylaws, um, they were re referred to various agencies for comment and two public information meetings were hosted by the applicant, one in the Irvine's Landing neighborhood and the other in Madeira Park. Uh, written submissions have also been received. The bylaw amendments is supported by the, the advisory planning commission and the majority of responses that come from both the local neighborhood and the other areas of Panda Harbor and the Sunshine Coast. Supporters believe the project has significant environmental, economic, and social benefits for the local and broader Sunshine Coast communities. Some local residents opposed to the bylaw amendments and have concerns about visual impact, traffic, and development intensity. 
Uh, infrastructure and financial feasibility are also key issues that need to be addressed. Um, the development is compatible with the official community plan policies, which recognize the economic and social benefits of commercial, educational, and institutional facilities in this location. The proposed intensity of the development is less than what would be permitted for the parcel's current com general commercial zoning designations. A professional transportation study indicates that the traffic to be generated by the facility has insignificant impact on the road system. It recommends that a total of 90 parking spaces are needed for the full build-out of the facility. Um, in, to, uh, in addition to the 51 on-site parking spaces, 39 spaces will need to be provided in two other locations with shuttle services. The applicant is in negotiation with property owners of several sites in Madeira Park and one site near the intersection of Sunshine Coast Highway and Garden Bay Road. The Ministry of Transportation has no concern with recommendations of the study. The existing SCRD water service can be upgraded to, sup uh, to supply water to the facility. Uh, the applicant is prepared to operate an on-site wastewater treatment system and has acquired permission to use an existing ocean outflow pipe as one possible approach. Uh, further information about servicing will be confirmed through the development application process. The applicant has completed a business plan to address many aspects of the project, uh, showing how parts can succeed financially and technologically from development to long-term operation. Um, the applicant has also provided a visual and shadow analysis to show that the facility, the facility has no significant visual impact on neighboring properties. POTS has made significant progress in project design and development, addressing um, SCRD requirements and many issues uh, uh, that uh, have been raised through the public consultation process. Uh, therefore, staff recommend the, the bylaws proceed to second reading and a public hearing be arranged. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sayo. Um, to the board, does the board have any questions uh, regarding the report, uh, regarding the project at this time? Um, Director McMahon? I just had a small question. I was curious, on the map on page six of the agenda shows that there is another commercial zone property across the street from the pod site. Is that, uh, but it appears to be used as residential. Is that a, like a non-conforming use or something? I can confirm that the zoning is presently C2 commercial across the road. Um, I can't confirm at this point the specifics of the conformity or non-conformity, but it is zone commercial, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee? The, um, the OCP, I think, calls it tourist right now, right? And, um, and yet it's zoned R2. So the OCP was envisioning it, or the existing R2, to be used for a commercial purpose. Is that a correct thought? Staff, sorry. Yes. Thank you, Chair Beamish. It is one single legal title presently, but there is a split zone on the parcel. The two-thirds of the parcel is, is presently zoned C3, and the remaining approximately one-third is, is zoned R2. The official community plan underlying land use des designation is tours commercial for the entire property. At the time of OCP development, there was a discussion about the promotion of commercial opportunities on commercially zoned parcels in, in, the, in the harbor area in particular. Thank you. Director Lee? The um, Urban's Landing had uh, stores and hotels and post offices 
and, um, and a meeting area. Do you know how they got changed from commercial to residential? Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Beamish. I am unaware of the specifics. My, my guess would be that that was established when bylaw 3 through 7 was adopted in 1990, but I'm unaware of the specifics of the present split zoning. Thank you. Director Hiltz. Um, a, qu a question about the, the parking and the adjacent roads. Is, is, there, is, is it in a rural area possible even to uh, legislate no parking along uh, rural roads? Like is that even a possibility within the framework as you understand it? Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Staff understand that uh, the Ministry of Transportation has authority to restrict parking along public right-of-ways and through conversations related to this file has indicated support for doing so in the area around this um, proposed uh, rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Director Lee. The uh, proposed zoning um, it looks to me like it's, uh, it is what I would call a down zone in that we've dropped the private club, we've dropped motel campground, we've dropped moving and storage facilities, we've dropped general repair, and we've dropped gas station from the zoning while retaining most of the, just adding the tourists to it. Do I have that right? Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, yes, the director's analysis is correct. I have a, I have a question to um, the um, corporate officer slash CAO. Uh, the recommendations we have before us, and there are four of them, um, but they're going to be predicated on number two, I, I, I think, being approved by the board. Um, that being that... Um, uh, the recommendation coming from this committee would be uh, uh, recommendation number two, that the Egmont Pender Harbor Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw number 708 uh, and, electrical and rezoning be forwarded to the board for second reading. If the board gives it second reading, then the other three recommendation, I assume, would follow. Would that be correct as opposed to making the assumption that the board is going to give a second reading? Uh, and that we then set the public hearing date and that we establish the, the panel? Well, what's the right process to do? Is, you know, the three, four, and five seem to assume that number two is being done by the board. That's all I'm asking. So what would, you, what would your recommendation be at this time in terms of how the board should proceed? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is, of course, up to the committee's discretion, but this is a typical process that we follow where we um, make the recommendation, presuming that the committee recommends forwarding the bylaw for second reading. We do uh, routinely uh, schedule the public hearing at the same time. Should the bylaw come forward to the board and there's a, a change of heart, uh, there's certainly an opportunity to okay. cancel the public hearing at that time if desired. Um, considering whether the bylaw is consistent with the financial plan and waste management plan, those are certain that that is not predicated on the bylaw getting second reading in any okay. way. And given the timing, would this uh, come forward to the board meeting this afternoon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I don't believe so. This was, there's plenty of time at the April 25th board meeting to do that. Okay, thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. I notice on page three in our report with regards to the Shishalt Nation and the archaeological site that is on this property that initially the applicant went forward with site alterations without following proper protocol. Um, if you go further on in our report, um, find the page on page nine. It now indicates that they've hired Golder and Associates or Golder Associates to assist 
so I'm assuming that they will now come into compliance and be following process as laid out. Thanks. Thank comment on that from staff? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. That, that information is correct. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Director Ties. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, just regarding that archaeological, um, um, uh, it says here that the, sorry, the, it says here on page three that the Shisha, the Shishal Nation uh, said that the archaeological site was disturbed before um, they could do a full impact assessment. So I'm wondering, what are the what are the are there any penalties involved in that, or they, what what is the the procedure when that, that those kind of things happen? Uh, I don't know if staff has any answers to that one. Um, thank you for the question, Chair Beamish. Uh, staff are just conferring to, to see if we recalled the specific penalties under the Heritage Conservation Act. As responsibility for enforcement of that act falls to the uh, provincial government, it's not an area where staff have direct involvement, but are aware that um, in general, uh, the, the, the province takes enforcement seriously and works with... Um, with landowners and those involved in site alterations to, to ensure compliance uh, moving forward as, uh, as is reported in the, uh, later in this staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hiltz, Director Hiltz. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair Beamish. Um, this is on page four. It's, it's re with regards to the wastewater uh, treatment facility. Um, it talks about the SCRD's future involvement and I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, right, right now it's intended to be operated by pods at 17.5 uh, cubic meters as an estimation. If, if that goes up to 22.5, will that at a point uh, incur where the regional district has to become involved in that, or can they continue to operate while exceeding the 22.5 cubic meters? So I'm, I'm looking at the, the future liability potential to the wastewater facility. Thank you, Chair Beamish. The SCRD subdivision servicing bylaw refers to large systems, small systems, with the, the cutoff being 22.7 cubic meters per day, which is also the cutoff where larger systems are to be approved by the Ministry of Environment and smaller systems can be improved, approved by Vancouver Coastal Health. Large systems, our bylaw requires large systems to be owned and operated by SCRD. Smaller systems can be owned and operated by, in the case of regular property development, the Strata Corporation or a utility corporation, potentially in this case. At this point, a, a small system would not necessarily automatically come to SCRD. There's possibility of acceptance, but it, it is at the discretion of both SCRD and the applicants to, to consider, whereas a large system or bylaw will require ownership. Thank you. Uh, Director just, Hiltz? Uh, just to follow up, so if, if they do in the future, in years to come, as it develops, exceed the 22.5, would, would it be incumbent on the regional district to take that over? Director Allen? Mr. Allen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Beaman. Uh, some on one of these uh -huh. titles. <laughs> Interesting question, Director Hiltz, and, and, and our, our precedent and our history have been accepting facilities based on their design at the time of approval. 
staff can report back with further clarity on scenarios should a, a system continue to grow and the implications. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Director Lee. Under the uh, proposed uh, zoning, would it still be possible to put in a marina or at least moorage? Sorry. Mr. Allen. Yes. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Again, excellent question, Director Lee. The rezoning application here is particular is, is for the for the upland parcel. This would be the adjacent um, ocean, which in Pender Harbor is, does not presently contain zoning. So approval for moorage would be subject to provincial government issuance of tenure. When rece in receipt of comments, particularly in unzoned areas, SCRD will look to the moorage application on the ocean matching and reflecting the upland use in this particular case with boats coming and going it would it would appear as though a marina would be a compatible use thank you thank you director hills uh thanks chair beamish final one um i'm going to come back to the parking and so um uh, the parking requirements for 51 spaces is required on site uh, and the total is required 90. So is, is this kind of a typical kind of uh, response to look for off-site parking if on site and is there a precedence in the regional district rural areas for this to happen in terms of uh, off-site parking uh, be a component of the on-site requirement? Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Certainly a unique circumstance in this particular case. Um, there are no direct precedent for this type of scale. Precedent would be, uh, particularly in electoral area, a subdivision on Hardy Island, Nelson Island, where people are parking to get to the island in some cases, and we have asked for zoned land that is suitable for parking, ordinarily more on a rural residential scale. In this particular case, recognizing the multiple methods in which people intend on arriving at this parcel and the recommendations of the traffic study is how we selected the required on-site parking. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, an area that is um, under rural planning so that uh, the municipalities, Seashelt and Gibsons, do not vote on this. So I'd look for direction from the rural directors as to what you would have wished to do with the recommendations before you. Director Pratt. Um, a process question first uh, because um, uh, I'm weighing a lot of different uh, and having lived in the area, uh, I, I spent the majority of the, the past quarter century I've lived on the coast uh, in actually the Irving's Landing area so I know this area quite well and uh, actually used to go to the Irving's Landing pub once upon a time so there's a little bit of history there um, and it, there's there's a certain amount of challenge and uh, off-road parking or on the side of the road parking is really not an option in a lot of this area because um, a lot of the places are barely it's like a lane and a half wide and um, the um, the process piece that I'm uh, curious about if we if the board does choose to go through um, go to the public hearing and and here's and then after that um, we decide that uh, for example that we don't want we want it or we 
the, the zoning may not uh, be in the community's or in the area's best interest, would the process have to start all over again for the pods or are they uh, certain further along? Like for example, if we were to, um, after the public hearing piece and, uh, and uh, for the example of the delegation suggesting just to stay um, at R2, I'm just wondering on that process piece where we would go back because the way the bylaw reads, it would essentially, if, if we go through the public hearing process and we decide, then the bylaw would then essentially, I guess, die and then we'd have to start the process all over again. Is that correct? Staff, who would like to respond? Thank you, uh, Chair Beamish. The Local Government Act uh, provides that uh, following a public hearing, uh, a number of options are available to local governments. Those would include uh, denial, in which case the, the bylaw is abandoned. Uh, minor amendments uh, can be made or if uh, a change relating to use or density is considered, uh, then uh, a, new, a new public hearing must be held and um, the process resets slightly. It's not, not necessarily square one, but um, it would involve uh, circling back and uh, performing additional public consultation activities. Thank you. Thank you. Director Pratt. Thank you. Um, it, thank you. That helps to, to clarify the process piece. So um, because uh, the amount of work that Pods and the Lagoon Society has done on this and, and our delegation, even though you have concerns about your your area, you everybody is the the process the um, the project is incredibly intriguing and there's uh, there's some huge benefits here for the Sunshine Coast but we really need at the same time to be to be mindful and make sure we're hearing the full um, the full gamut of of how it's going to affect everyone and hear all the concerns and be mindful of that um, so being that um, we I think we do need to go forward in this process and I'd be happy to um, I, I don't know if the if the board is going to want to go uh, um, item by item here I'm happy to move the other four recommendations as a whole and also volunteer myself to be the chair of the um, public hearing okay um, is that a Make that a, a motion, a motion. Yeah. and yeah. and if um, if the rest of the rural directors are in favor with moving all four or the numbers two through five, I should say, with myself as the chair of the public hearing, or um, we'll start that as the motion. And to fill in the item five, we would need an alternate chair as well. So then do we have a uh, an alternate chair for the public hearing, Director Lee. So the um, re resolution would include Director. Pratt as the Chair Pratt as the uh, Delegated Chair and Director Lee as the Delegated Alternate Chair for the public hearing. So that's motions two, three, four, and five. And the motions are for the for the gallery that the Egmont and Pender Harbor Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw number 708.1 and Electoral Area A Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 337.116 be forwarded to the board for second reading. And that the Egmont Pender Harbor Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 708.1 is considered consistent with the SRD's 2019-2023 Financial Plan and 2011 Solid Waste Management Plan, and that a public hearing to consider the bylaws be scheduled for May 14, 2019, at 7 p.m. In the Pender Harbor Community Hall, located at 12901 Material Park Road, Madeira Park, BC, and further that Director Pratt be delegated as the chair and Director Lee be delegated as the alternate chair for the public hearing. As the motions have been seconded, moved, seconded. Do we have a seconder? Seconded. Um, 
Discussion? Director McMahon? Yeah, I do. I think it's important to take it to public hearing. Uh, this is a big project. It will have a big impact, uh, hopefully a positive one, on Pender Harbor. Um, I, I take seriously a lot of the concerns that the residents have raised. Um, some of them uh, fall outside our jurisdiction. We, we can't comment on the financial viability uh, of the project, and a number of the parking and traffic concerns are outside our jurisdiction, whether we like it or not. Uh, but I do think that, that it's the right process to go forward to a public hearing and, and hear from the public. Okay. Director Tice. Thank you. I, uh, I also second uh, Director McMahon's um, concerns. Uh, I think parking, uh, access, it's a pretty long and windy road to get there, and, uh, and uh, the, the bus shuttles are, uh, as well as, you know, uh, some of the traffic issues I, I think are probably my chief concern here, but I, I really like the idea of, of that, and I think that the, the project is potentially in the uh, greater public interest, and I, I really like um, I like the idea of, of um, having a, a non-for-profit uh, with such a, uh, and I think it would add a lot of prestige to uh, Pender Harbor in, in the long run. So um, I, I hear the concerns, and uh, I think we should go to forward to second uh, second reading. Thank you, Director Lee. I'll start by saying I, I do believe we need to go forward to the public hearing so we get more input from everybody and uh, everybody gets a chance to be heard all at once. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, parking, but uh, maybe maybe we can have a breakthrough and this thing will work. <laughs> I, I'm very supportive of an uh, environmentally friendly business that PODS is proposing. And uh, it should employ the younger professionals and perhaps attract similar type people to the coast here. And hopefully it'll help the entire coast. So very concerned about the impact on the local residents. And if there's something we can do to help between now and then, hopefully that will be done. So, yes, I'm in favor of going forward. Director Pratt. Um, and I'll, I'll echo the, the words of uh, um, my fellow directors. Um, my, my biggest concerns in this area, of course, are around transportation and the impact on the, uh, on the local residents because it is, it is a, 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 I'm going to say, sleepy residential community. It's, it's the best way to explain mm -hmm. it. Um, I think the most excitement was usually uh, my boxer meeting David's boxer on the road and <laughs> having a little play. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I, I do think it's really important to proceed forward with the public hearing and looking at next steps after having that wholesome, uh, that wholesome, wholesome uh, <laughs> my information uh, about the process. So, um, and getting more input from the community as well. Director Lee. One more thing. I'd sure like to thank you guys for your presentation. It takes a lot to speak up, so thank you for doing that. Okay, seeing no more directors wishing to speak to the issue, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, thank you. That's passed. And you will have the chance to make your presentation again uh, to the public hearing. So thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you. Okay, board, our next item on our agenda, um, item 4, Annex B, uh, Manager of Plan and Development. Development variance permit application uh, for electoral area E. So, who will speak to this? Mr. Allen? Yes, thank you, Chair Beamish. This is a development variance permit for a property located at 291 Pratt Road in Elphinstone. And it is the intent is to increase the floor space of an allowable auxiliary dwelling unit from 55 square meters to 70 square meters. At present, there is a dwelling on the site, 70 square meters, and the zoning allows one dwelling without floor space restriction and a second dwelling with a maximum of 55 square meters. The intent here is to allow the singular dwelling 
that's located there presently to be utilized as the auxiliary dwelling for the purpose of construction of another dwelling. So it is a, a development variance permit request to increase that auxiliary dwelling floor space by 15 square meters. The APC has reviewed the application and supports it and we have conducted neighbor notification. We've received one letter in favor and one letter opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, directors, uh, discussion? Director McMahon? Yes, I attended the APC meeting. Uh, there were not too many concerns about this. Uh, the APC certainly said that, um, you know, getting rid of any potential uh, rental properties at this time, given our re uh, rental crisis on the coast, would, would not be helpful. And, of course, uh, under the bylaw, Review uh, 212. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. Uh, but we're looking at uh, changing the the requirements, the floor area requirements for auxiliary dwellings anyway. So uh, this seems fairly straightforward to me. And would you care to move, move the res? Recommendation that the development variant permit to vary the floor area of an auxiliary building and under section 502.8 A and B of the zoning bylaw from 19 uh, from 55 square meters to 70 square meters be issued. Okay. Seconder? Seconded. All in favor? Opposed? No, seeing none. That's passed. Approved. Thank you. The next item is Annex C, and that's a development variance permit. And um, this is uh, Mr. Allen going to speak to this one as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Beamish. This is a development variance permit for the potential construction of an addition to an existing dwelling located adjacent to North Lake in the Egmont area. The Egmont Pender Harbor Official Community Plan contains a policy where Consideration, consideration may be given for a one-time only addition to an existing non-conforming sited dwelling provided that the addition contains a maximum floor space or deck space of 28 square meters and does not encroach any further towards the lake. So an addition can be located on the side or the rear of a, a dwelling. We recommend, oh, pardon me, this has been considered by the Egmont Pender Harbor Advisory Committee and received a notion of support. And we recommend issuance of this variance subject to the register of a covenant on title, indicating it is a one-time only addition and any further construction in the future must meet setback. We also recommend that should comments be received from the Seashelt Nation, they be considered and addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, discussion, Mr. Lee? Um, I was at the uh, meeting when the, the, uh, the plan was approved by our OPC, and uh, I have had a look at the site myself, and I, I accept the recommendation that we should go forward. Do you move the recommendation? Yes. Move yes. The recommendation. So seconder? Seconded. Discussion? Director Hiltz? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair Beamer. So it's a question about um, on uh, page Fifty. It says that the covenant would include a notice on title with regards to the streamside protection and enhancement area, and in the recommendation, that's not included in the covenant. So I'm just not sure if it's incomplete or it's dealt with another way. Mr. Allen. Yes, thank you, Chair Beamish. It is a, a standard covenant that we use that it, that includes both the protection of native vegetation within the Lakeshore area and that it be one time only covenant, both of which are identified in the official community plan. So yes, building on that comment, our recommendations could have been clearer to include both, but the intent is it's a standard covenant that we look for that contains both. Thank you. Director Hills. Uh, so could, could a motion be made to include the streamside enhancement area protection in, in the recommendation to make it clear? Is that a, a reasonable thing to staff? Staff, is that, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, staff would uh, be supportive of that inclusion. Thank you. Good. 
You'd make that uh, recommendation as an uh, amendment? Yes, I would li like to make that recommendation to include that in the covenant in the uh, recommendation, yes. As an amendment to the recommendation, uh, seconded? Seconded? Uh, most uh, voting on the amended, uh, the, the amendment, sorry, to, to add that. Sorry. All in favor? All in favor? Okay. Voting on the resolution then as amended? Thank you. All in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, Annex D, item 6 on the agenda, and this is a development variance permit um, for electrical area A as well um, for DBP 00041. And again, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Beamish. This application, very similar to the previous, however, this one is located, this property is located adjacent to Hotel Lake applying for a development variance permit for an addition to an existing cabin um, pursuant to the same section of the official community plan, also for, supported by the Advisory Planning Commission. Staff recommend issuance of this permit and could consider a previous similar amendment to protect lakeside, lakeside vegetation as well. Thank you. Director Lee, do you have any comment? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, again, we, uh, I was with the APC when we did a site visit on this, and uh, th this thing uh, makes good sense. And uh, the property was built before the setback was required to start with. It's an older property, but well-maintained. So I'd like to move that the recommendation be accepted. Director Hills. Um, again, I'd like to make a, a motion to amend the recommendation to include the streamside in, uh, protection area in it. Uh, so amendment to the recommendation one. Recommendation. Um, Director Lee, is that? Sorry, I have a question. Yes. When I read this, it said streamside and we're lakeside. Are they one and the same things? Because there's no stream on this property yeah. or the other property. <laughs> Director Allen, Mr. Allen. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Beamish. And yes, Director Lee, you are correct. Pursuant to the repairing area regulation, it's called streamside protection and enhancement area, and we commonly refer to that as the SPIA. However, lakes are included as well. So it's lake or stream, fresh water. Thank you. Okay. Um, Director Lee, you've moved the recommendation. It has not been seconded yet, so that the, the addition of this would be just be a Friendly motion to add this to the... Uh, yes, the, I second right. it, uh, Okay, well, and then seconding the motion with the, uh, that addition. Okay. And uh, all in favor of the motion. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, one question to staff, and um, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, when... Uh, so I hear from the, uh, from the OCP that th this is something that's, uh, that, that was considered and that is that the 20-meter setback will not come into effect after they've done the additions um, for any for any further building. Uh, is that, are, are there any undeveloped properties around these lakes that where the 20 meter setback would actually be adhered to when there's an application uh, going through right now? And, um, and uh, I, I also have a question of, do we want to encourage people to keep adding um, to old, badly insulated, and inefficient buildings um, so that they can maintain their current setbacks. Um, so uh, it's sort of a bit of a perverse incentive in my, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Allen, do you have any comments on that? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Beamish. This is an interesting one. If you include all of the lakes in electoral area A, ranging from Hotel and North Lake, through to the larger lakes, Sackanaw, Ruby Lake. We have a, the full spectrum of large properties with a house, large properties containing subdivision potential, small properties with houses where there really isn't very, very limited, if any, ability to achieve setbacks, as well as small properties that have yet to be constructed on. This policy was originally installed into the OCP bylaw 432, which was adopted in 1998. It's been utilized over the years, and it has been a way of leveraging an increase in septic treatment as well as moving back 
taking portions of existing cabins away and moving back. And when we reviewed in the now presently adopted OCP, it was the advisory committee as well as many lake residents who spoke to were very supportive of continuing on with this consideration of this policy. That said, the policy is clearly for consideration and not obligation. And there are occasions where staff work with property owners to come up with better solutions. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motions that I uh, have before you? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. And uh, nobody opposed. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to Annex E, Item 7, which is the Sun Coaster Trade Arrow Phase 2, uh, phase two uh, Concept Design. And um, Julie Clark, Planner, are you going to speak to this? Welcome. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Diamond Head Consulting was hired by SCRD with grant funds from BC Association for Healthy Living Society to ground truth a proposed route for Sun Coaster Trail Phase 2 and use this data to prepare a trail concept plan. The proposed uh, trail design principles and proposed route were the subject of a public participation process between 2016 and 2018, which re was reported on last month at this committee. A concept plan is used in the initial planning and budgeting of a project. In this case, it helps to visualize how the trail could be used, provides a design concept with real data, and provides an opportunity to discuss feasibil feasibility by assessing project challenges and providing preliminary cost estimates. As noted in the trail concept report, the proposed route is almost exclusively on public lands. It heavily relies on the use of existing trails and local roads, and it could include phased development and have preliminary routes, particularly for the areas currently identified with route gaps. The purpose of this report is to pre present the trail concept plan and seek direction from the committee regarding next steps. Next steps include partnership development, detailed planning and costing, including addressing route gaps highlighted in the trail concept plan. If the committee wishes to proceed, an update report will be provided in quarter four of this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Board, any questions, discussions uh, about the plan? Director McMahon. Yeah, I, I first off, I, I recognize that getting cyclists from Langdale through to Area D is one of the most challenging parts of this route. Uh, the, the last proposal at the open house I was at was to route the cyclists up cemetery, which um, also has its challenges, not least of which uh, very steep hills and uh, soon to be cement trucks sharing the road. But I have the gravest misgivings about sending cyclists ar along Reed Road. Uh, Reed Road right now is just about the most dangerous road in Area E. It has become the bypass, whether we like it or not. It has logging trucks. It has huge semi-trailer trucks coming along that road on a regular basis. It has congestion. There are no paved shoulders. Uh, the town of Gibsons has plans to uh, put in a bike path on one side of the road, but you know, most cyclists who are serious cyclists are not going to cross the road to get to a bike path on the other side and then cross it back again. The bike path that Gibsons is, is planning to put in will be put in as funds uh, become available. So it'll probably come in in sections. So what are you supposed to do, you know, in between the sections that aren't built yet? Uh, it, it, it opens a can of worms for me. Um, I... I, we need to address Reed Road anyway. We, we really, really do. I don't know how we get Moti to the table, but we have got to do that because, of course, Gibsons has one half of the road and Area E has the other. And we really desperately need safety improvements uh, on that road. So uh, I, I, am, I am reluctant to send tourists to their deaths on Reed Road. Uh, <laughs> It won't do tourism a lot of good. Uh, I realize that our options are, 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 are thin on the ground, but um, anyway, I just wanted to express my misgivings. 
Thank you. Other comments? Director Hiltz. Thanks, Chair Beamish. Um, this this is re uh, in, in a question about the, uh, uh, what page are we on in the agenda? It's 99. Uh, very preliminary estimates of construction costs of the roof. And I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, is this kind of equivalent to an engineering cost D class estimate, or is this not as rigorous as even class D? So I'm trying, trying to, how, how accurate is this in initial estimate? 99. Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, staff included the costing information as as it's helpful for conceptualizing the types of costs that are likely to be incurred with the project, but are extremely cautious about relying on the numbers as even a Class D estimate, noting the types of work that's required uh, in the next step, including things like archaeological reconnaissance, where costs could vary uh, quite a bit. And also, and this is uh, somewhat further to, the, to uh, Director McMahon's prior question, there are still some root gaps where, uh, as noted on page 100, uh, staff feel further research is needed. And so the cost estimates that are included are, uh, may not be relevant for uh, a possible solution to some of those gaps, including that, that area along, uh, around Reed Road. So helpful in terms of understanding the types of costs may be order of magnitude, but um, not a classified estimate at this point. Thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. On page 100, it also refers to the segment Selma Park to downtown Seashelt. Um, and Seashelt has received some funding and will be moving forward with our section. We are in consultation with the Seashelt Nation because some of this goes through their lands as well. They've also had the recent foundation agreement, so there's some negotiations and things happening but we anticipate that it will move forward in some form or another. Director Ties. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wanted to uh, express my uh, amazement and, uh, and respect to uh, the planning staff. Uh, this, is a, this is not an easy project, and uh, I, I think um, uh, Mrs. Clark and her team have, have done a, a fine job uh, Putting together a route and, and some even some preliminary costing, which to me would seem like a very daunting task. Um, so uh, I I really like the idea of the Sun, uh, Sunshine Coaster Trail, and uh, uh, I think um, I would like to move the recommendations as uh, as presented. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Seconded. Director Seegers. Some of you may have seen the uh, press announcement or press release that came out from Ice-T. Yes. Tofino and Hukulet actually have been working on some trails over on their area from one end to the other, and they just received a very substantial grant from Ice-T to facilitate some of that work. So um, I've already sent that off to staff. They're aware of that, and should we decide to move forward with this, I'm sure they'll be reaching out to see what they can get in support. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Quite new to this project, but it sure is a good one. I, I do note we've been from 2016 to 2019 so far. I don't know how much of the trail we've got built. Is it possible to, if you know parts of the trail are ready to go, just to go ahead and start building them? Staff, is it... Uh Thank, thank you for the question, uh, Chair Beamish. The idea of a phased approach is one that um, staff will consider as a next step. Um, there are many segments of the proposed alignment that, that exist on the ground, um, constructed, uh, constructed by current or past um, uh, mostly community groups. And so one of the key aspects that needs to be planned as a next step is what partnership with those groups should there still be a current stewardship group uh, involved uh, looks like. Um, but as a, as a more global comment, uh, always before SCRD constructs um, authorization from landowners and the appropriate um, steps with regards to protection of cultural heritage and um, engagement with uh, adjacent uh, property owners takes place. So subject to those, um, 
staff are looking at ways to move forward with the easier pieces of the trail in a timely way, noting the community interest in seeing uh, active transportation links and recreational opportunities developed. Thanks. Thank you. Director Hiltz. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair Premier. Um, um, I'm, there's kind of two, two bits running through my mind. There is the, uh, the $1,300 left in the, the grant, so I, I'm wondering about the, the work plan, the resources to, in order to ca carry out the work. And then there's the other piece that is the, um, I'm, I'm thinking of in Victoria, there's a, a, a creek in uh, Victoria which they have kind of a 100-year plan to restore a natural creek. So it's a vision or a concept plan. And that plan is, is very much pushed out to the public so that they can see the opportunities that occur. And I'm wondering uh, a little bit what Director Lee is saying is how to phase it and how to, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking GIS, like a layer on the GIS that identifies the proposed route so people know as they develop land or opportunities come up that that phasing would be in there. So I'm kind of, how much resources are available to do the work and then how to push the information out so that when opportunities arise, the public and developers understand that that opportunity is there. You care to comment on that, Mr. Hill, or is, uh, Mr. Hall? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, staff would comment that the, the director's question fits quite well with, um, with our previous comment about uh, the importance of partnership to future mm -hmm. success. And um, uh, that's implied in the, in, in the comment uh, listed in our communication strategy in this report that that the success of the project will be tied to um, relationships that are built uh, to, to drive the project forward. And, and that speaks in part to the, the need to attract resources. There, there currently is no capital um, funding plan for this project. And so fundraising, including grants, as uh, Director Seekers noted, uh, will form part of the considerations and next steps. Thanks. Director Ties. Uh, yeah, well, mentioning partnerships and, and fundraising, um, I, uh, I'm wondering if, if it's um, if it, it might be in the best, best interest of the board to uh, put a motion into UBCM. Uh, I guess it's too late for ABICC now, but to, into UBCM um, to see if we can make the province accountable for the creation of bike and walking paths um, um, along, you know, Moti property because, uh, you know, the province wants us to achieve our climate action goals and yet we only have roads that only accommodate cars at this point and, um, and I think there should be uh, maybe some, some desire towards uh, getting some alternatives in, in place. And uh, on that question, um, who is now in charge of that a whole uh, MOTI and uh, gas tax negotiation? Director Sears, do you want to respond? Okay, staff, uh, want to respond? Uh, thank you. In partnership with the Planning and Community Development Department, uh, I am working with the uh, working group from AVICC, a number of regional districts on advancing some active transportation infrastructure design guidelines as well as an MOU. Uh, participated in a conference call yesterday and expect a report on a draft MOU to come forward likely within the next two months. Um, and as for the UBCM resolution, uh, we do have a report coming forward at the end of the month at Corporate Services Committee where we can uh, are planning to raise the issue of possible resolutions for UBCM. So we might want to uh, put that Thank aside. You. We certainly have had a number of resolutions mm -hmm. in the past about uh, transportation and bike lanes. Thank you. Director Sears? Thank you. Uh, the province is actually doing active transportation consultation province-wide. Um, I attended one of the sessions in Vancouver. Two of our councillors attended as well. And one of the, the key uh, recommendations that's come out of there is that Ministry of Transportation, as the connector basically between various communities up and down, you know, throughout BC, 
require um, looking at how do they facilitate active transportation and bike routes, et cetera. It's come out very strongly at every one of the consultation sessions. There's also an online uh, feedback form. It's available, I think, until Monday of next week. You can give online feedback. So I've forwarded that out to various people as well. I don't know if I forwarded it to the board, but I could do that mm -hmm. to forward it on. And uh, you can put your information in there. Th it's being, it's being um, put forward loudly in a lot of areas, given the role that Ministry of Transport has on roads outside municipalities. Director McMahon. I just wanted, I was wondering if there has been any consult, consultation so far with Modi uh, about the portions of the proposed route that go along roads. Staff? Julie Clark. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, very early conversations with MOTI staff have been had to share the route with them. So more detailed planning, more partnership development is what is proposed for the next uh, stages going forward. I think it, uh, speaking of the town of Gibsons, I know that there is work planned for Reed Road uh, this coming year. And as the uh, development of lands on the south side of Reed Road continue, the further work will be done on uh, walking trail, walking uh, sidewalks and, and bike paths along there. But that's on the south side. But I know that it's supposed to be multi-directional, uh, potentially. So work is being done there. Director McMahon? Yeah, I, I will be raising this again at the Transportation Committee meeting. But we, we do need to have some sort of a get-together with areas EF, Gibsons, and Moti to talk about Reed Road. Because it's nice that you're doing your half, but there's another half of the road. So we need to, like, move this forward in a... I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have a resolution on the floor. Uh, and uh, it's been moved and seconded. And that is that um, the recommendations that uh, proceed, um, the, based on the trail concept, staff proceed with partnership collaboration development for detailed stage one planning and research and that project status be reported to a committee in Q4 2019. So are there any further discussions on the resolution? Can I call the question then on the resolution? All in favor of the resolution? Thank you. Um, the question of staff, and I just wonder if it would be possible to uh, invite staff to come to Gibson's and make a similar presentation of this information as to the, the status of this project, just as an update. Um, I think it would be useful for the... Uh, the, uh, our council as well as the community to, to hear that. So uh, perhaps an upcoming committee of the whole meeting would be appropriate. So uh, thank you. Any further discussion of this before we move on? And uh, say it will be come up again at the Transportation Committee meeting. So thank you. Okay, uh, next one is the um, item number eight, Annex F. And that is the Recreation Sites and Trail Agreement Renewal for Sprockets. And Rebecca Port, welcome. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, following board direction of January 31st, staff have been engaging with Coast Mountain Bike Trail Association, a local volunteer organization, and Rec Sites and Trails BC, the provincial body overseeing recreation sites to explore the potential for community partnership to help manage and maintain Sprockets Recreation Site. Sprockets is a provincial recreation site in Area F, West House Sound, that is popular for mountain biking and hiking. Staff recommend that the board endorse two separate two-year agreements as follows. Firstly, a partnership agreement between the province and the STRD to manage Sprockets. Through this agreement, the province would maintain ownership of the site and would support the efforts to manage the site. SCRD would be responsible for ensuring the site was maintained to the standard outlined in the partnership agreement. The second agreement would be a letter of understanding between Coast Mountain Bike Trail Association and the SCRD. This would outline the roles and responsibilities between the two parties. SCRD would support the Coast Mountain Bike Trail Association, who would be responsible for providing much of the on-the-ground work at Sprockets. 
all three parties would develop and agree on annual work plans and priorities. Thank you. Uh, directors, any questions? I um, have two recommendations in front of you. Director Hiltz. Um, I, 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 the seeking of the partnerships and a solution here, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the of, of moving it forward, and yeah, I would um, uh, make a motion on the recommendations. Move the recommendations. Seconded. Seconded. Further discussion? Director Ties. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the people involved with the Coast Mountain Biking Asso uh, Association, and uh, I, I, I have confidence that they will be able to uphold their, their side of the, the bargain, and I think they're um, a respectable bunch of people. Um, so I'm in, I'm in full support of this one. Director McMahon. Uh, while I am in support of this, I just wanted to be clear, though, that if for some reason the Coast Mountain Bike Trail Association could not hold up their end of the bargain, then the SCRD would be on the hook for the maintenance of this area for the next five years. Is that correct? Staff? Thank you, Chair Beamish. The agreement would be for two years. Uh, that was agreed upon between in discussions with the province. Seeing no further discussion, I call the call the um, vote on the resolution. All in favor? Seeing no opposed, motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item number nine, which is uh, Annex G of your agenda. And this is um, referral for commercial general use application within Sprock Kids area, Whistler Outback Adventures Limited. And again, Rebecca Port. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, in February 2019, SCRD received a provincial referral for commercial use at Sprock Kids Recreation Area. Whistler Outback Adventures is seeking approval from the province to expand their mountain bike guiding operations to include a number of areas within Sea to Sky Corridor and the Sunshine Coast, including Sprockets. While this may be a viable venture in the future at Sprockets, at this time there are some concerns with the referral. As discussed in the previous report, SDRD is currently exploring a new management and maintenance model for Sprockets. Under, until this is stabilized, additional commercial use could make it difficult for the new model to be successful. Also, Sprockets is currently requiring a number of trail improvements to bring it to standard. Additional usage at this time may complicate completion of the needed improvements. And finally, additional use would create wear and tear that we are not yet in the position to address. Thank you. Uh, Director Ties. Uh, yeah, I... Just as reading this, I I, am, uh, I was just wondering if there might be an opportunity to maybe uh, get some funding out of uh, Whistler Outback Adventures to uh, actually support the Coast Mountain Biking uh, Association through, uh, I don't know, a $20 per rider kind of uh, uh, support. And I, I, think that I think rather than say no, uh, we should at least open that discussion whether they'd be willing to chip in. Um, with the maintenance of the trails and, and, and helping with the funding. And um, I'm wondering if any of that kind of conversation has been had yet. Steph? Thank you, uh, Chair Beamish. Uh, the coordination around fees would be coordinated with the province. So it wouldn't be within the SDRD's realm to negotiate directly with um, a commercial venture. Director Seegers. Thank you. Follow up on that. Um, given we are going to be indicating at this point um, our support or not of this, potentially that could be part of what is put forward. That at this point, given, um, you know, I mean the recommendation is refusal, right? Because because of the maintenance time and cost, et cetera. But it could be that it could be open for reconsideration should funding through this model be available. Director Hiltz. Uh, 
follow up on the follow up. <laughs> um, uh, on page 190 of their business plan, it says Arbutus Roots uh, remain committed to trail maintenance in all the communities in which it operates. So yeah, maybe that could be included in the recommendation that the province does seek um, funding models to from Arbutus to inc uh, as part of the recommendation going forward. I think. Director Tice. Um, so yeah, um, I guess we're going to draft a little motion on the floor here, but um, I, I would like to, I would like to, rather than turning away potential tourism uh, revenue as well as, uh, you know, give potential um, financial assistance to uh, the uh, maintenance of this area, I think um, there should be, uh, that we should maybe make an amendment that, um, in, in that regard, that the, um, that uh, the we are currently uh, not in favor of this uh, motion, but we could change our mind. That if um, I'm really bad at drafting motions, <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody else should give that a try. Could it be that rather than a refusal, then you look at a support for the application, subject to confirmation that the um, the applicant will contribute to the cost of the maintenance of yeah. the facility and the trails. <laughs> Director Hiltz? Um, in the way these referrals go, you don't, um, I, I think I am still supportive of the refusal. There, um, is I, I think that the staff is trying to work on, the, on our local uh, Coast Mountain biking as, as the lo local kind of body to lead it up and I would, I don't want to set up a competition between our Butus roots and our local groups, so the autonomy. So I, I, that's why I'm thinking that the refusal or the referral still needs to be a refusal based on the options available to us with these recommendations to accompany it. That's kind of where I'm sort of thinking. Director Pratt. Thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, I want to be careful in how we word our um, word this going forward. I support um, what's been said about if we can receive funding, then then there's a certain amount of support that we do have for this. But at the same time, I don't want to put us in a position that we say, yes, subject to, because the yes is at the front. I'd rather say no, however, um, is, is how I think our messaging has to go back because we don't want to, um, we want to make sure that our trails here on the coast are properly supported um, before we open it up to a lot more traffic that it's not ready for. So um, I support the refusal. However, if funding, uh, if additional funding is available to support that, then um, then I think it's it's open for negotiation. And um, in that case, so I'm I'm not going to wordsmith that on the floor. <laughs> Uh, but I, I yeah. yeah, Mr. Hall. Staff, in listening to the committee's discussion, um, if it's helpful, staff could offer that if the direction is to remain, uh, uh, to keep the, the, the lead recommendation of refusal at this time, uh, a clause E could be added uh, to, the, to the recommendation as drafted that states future consideration would be strengthened by a commitment to a local investment in trail maintenance. Okay. Director Lee. I, uh, I was wondering about the motivation of CMBTA to take over the, uh, to take over looking after this for us. Perhaps it's within their mandate to encourage people to come here and this might be they might entirely be willing to put the extra work in in order to have the uh, advantage of uh, additional tourism and additional interest in the coast by bike users. So to me, it seems like we should ask them what they think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Director Ties. Yeah, I think that maybe uh, along with uh, what Mr. Hall uh, recommended there for an E, uh, we could also say and that uh, they seek support from the CMBTA um, it, with uh, and as part of strengthening their argument for being able to uh, conduct business here. And uh, I think that would uh, probably 
um, make all the parties happy if that was the case. So that would be a be an item F on the uh, on the list. Is that uh, Mr. Hall? Any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. So staff would note that there are many. Although the Coast Mountain Bike Trails Association um, has uh, indicated a willingness to step up as a partner and uh, and make some direct investments in the site through through uh, volunteer work. They are not the only user of the site. There are other cycling groups and hiking groups that make use of the site and, and might well um, uh, have comments um, as well. The, this referral is a public referral as well, so those groups can make comment directly to the province. And, and as a, a further comment, staff would note that um, there were three issues identified uh, in the staff report. Um, one relates to um, the, the relationship between wear and tear and the need for local investment and, and uh, to keep the site up and um, the, the committee's discussion uh, has, has touched on that. The other two issues relate um, as much or more to, to site uh, safety and risk and staff feel that there's work that needs to be done in the site. Um, and, and a plan is afoot, uh, as noted in the previous report, to address that need. Um, but until such time as that work is completed, um, it would be staff's perspective that uh, growing the use of the site is best uh, postponed uh, for a moment. Thanks. Director McMahon. Yeah, I'm wondering whether we really need to change this motion because we've made clear sort of what, what our direction is and staff can have conversations, uh, but I'm not sure we need to build it into the motion. This And, and um, I hear the concerns about the area because it is the former landfill and uh, things tend to surface there unexpectedly. So, yeah, there are concerns. Okay, we haven't. We don't have a motion on the floor at this point in time, so we're still um, crafting, and talking. Um, you know, there's yeah, yeah. suggestions of amendments to the recommendation, but there was no no motion. Yeah, Director Ties. Well, I I would like to see that uh, point E added, so I'll make a motion to amend it uh, to add E uh, as uh, recommended by Mr. Hall, and uh, and then I would. Uh, I guess we'll have to vote on that one first. Could we hear your proposed motion or recommendation again, Mr. Hall? Uh, for the committee's consideration, it was future consideration would be strengthened by a commitment to a local investment in trail maintenance. Okay. Director Seegers? Yeah, point of order. There actually isn't a motion on the floor no right now to be amended. That's right. So uh, we're the recommendation. That's what we're doing. Make yeah. a recommendation. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So adding adding to the recommendation. So, so the the motion would include the the addition. Right. So is that your understanding, Mr. Director yeah, Tice? So you're moving. You're moving recommendation number two with the addition of an E uh, as stated. Yeah. 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 And do I have a seconder for that, Director Hills? Uh, discussion now on that with the addition of item E uh, uh, to the recommendation. Seeing none, we have a uh, vote on the vote. Uh, call the question. Oh, Director Hills. I, I, I'm, I'm supportive of the of E because it is in the provincial government's um, yeah. jurisdiction. So to have them do the negotiations is kind of what we're trying to move forward. So, okay. so voting on the motion. All in favor. Opposed? Seeing none, thank you. That's approved with that addition to the item E now. So thank you. Okay, it's just 11 o'clock, so we'll carry on. So uh, we're now. Do you want a quick break? Would the uh, board like five minutes? Yep. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Thank you.
Yeah, I was, I was thinking we started. I was thinking we started at ten, but we started at nine thirty. Yeah. <laughs> have been here for a while. Yeah. 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 Sometimes when you got your hand up, I don't know if you're pointing somebody out to me or. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> Is that a motion or is that a uh, <laughs> direction? <laughs> Okay, seeing everybody in their places, we can resume our meeting. Yeah, thank you. There you go. You've been there before, haven't you? That's right. Okay, we're now on to item number 10, and this is the report, the insert that we received this morning, and this concerns the, uh, the uh, refriger replacement and refrigeration plant upgrade. Um, and we'll speak to Mr. Robinson, who will speak to that, or Mr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish, and I have uh, Manager Robinson here if there are technical questions. Uh, following board direction, an RFP for ice plant upgrades at the Sunshine Coast Arena uh, was prepared. One compliant bid was received in response to RFP 19384. Receiving one bid is reasonable given the very small number of industrial refrigeration firms in the South Coast and Lower Mainland region capable of doing the work, uh, and staff estimate that would be fewer than five. And the continuing high market demand for services as arenas and refrigeration plants around the province respond to changes and orders issued following Fernie. Staff recommend that award be made to Tempro Refrigeration for up to the value noted in the report. And work will proceed immediately following award on a timeline plan to allow September ice installation per the normal schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Um, discussion of the report? I see we're saving some money there in terms of our budget estimate. Um, a little bit. Hmm. Director Seegers? There's no discussion. I'll move the recommendations as presented on 225A. Okay, recommendations have been moved, seconded. Okay, all in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? That passes. Thank you. Thank you, staff. I could give you some questions, Mr. Robinson, just so you'll feel good about being here. <laughs> but thank you for your report. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we'll move on now to um, item H. Uh, sorry, item 11, Annex H of the agenda, and this is the um, quarterly report for the Planning and uh, Community Development Department. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair Beamish. Every quarter... Uh, planning and community development reports on our departmental activities and staff are pleased to answer any questions on the activities and statistics reported from the first quarter of 2019. Thanks. Director McMahon. Sure, I have questions. On page 228, it shows that Area E had three subdivision applications uh, in the last quarter and I was curious which subdivisions those were. That is many, it seems. Well, excellent question. Um, <laughs> the 
two notable ongoing ones at the upper end of King Road, I think, have been going on for some period of time. So those are the two that come to mind immediately, but I would exclude those. Uh, there is one down um, a, a one-acre parcel that there's an application to split into two down near Clark 15th area that, uh, that immediately comes to mind as well. Uh, beyond that, I apologies, I struggle to recollect specific. Director McMahon? Yeah, I have another question on page 234. Why are we maintaining Esperanza Road? Staff, sorry, Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. There are a number of Ministry of Transportation roads uh, that are effectively considered private roads and maintained by those who use them. And there are two that um, staff can immediately think of. One is the section of Esperanza Road uh, that provides access to Shirley Macy Park and Soames Hill Park. And the other is a portion of the access road to Whispering Firs, where occasional grading uh, is done in order to maintain uh, the road and do the do the regional district's uh, part in keeping the infrastructure up uh, for the benefit of the other residents in the area. Thanks. Thank you. Director Ties. Yeah, on uh, page 227, uh, there's a mention about the Ho Highway 101 corridor study, and um, and I, I guess uh, my question is, would this be the time to address the uh, Davis Bay and getting an alternative going over Chapman Creek? And uh, does Moti know the, uh, as to how we feel about this, uh, or is it, is it just a, sort of an implied knowledge? <laughs> Mr. Hall? Thank you, Chair Beamish. In addition to collating the various um, studies and plans that the regional district has approved that relate to transportation or development and bear on the highway, staff also provided past uh, board motions and correspondence uh, and minutes that do include reference to both um, pinch points and their impact on uh, emergency response and recovery and uh, the impact of sea level rise on the transportation network on the coast and the Davis Bay Chapman Creek Bridge were mentioned in both of those contexts. Thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. When Modi came up here, they also met with the District of Seashell and we reiterated all of that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Lee. Could you uh, just, uh, I'd like to understand how we get involved in the subdivision applications. I think it goes to the provincial government and comes back to us somehow. So I'm just wondering what's involved there. Mr. Hall, would you like to explain the process, or Mr. Allen, explain the process? Yes, thank you, Chair Beamish. Uh, for all properties within rural electoral areas in British Columbia, including each of the electoral areas on the Sunshine Coast, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is the approving authority there is a provincial approving officer for the Lower Mainland District who's based in the Coquitlam office, and we work with staff in the Coquitlam office as well as folks here. But our, because we have zoning and because we have subdivision district regulations as well as subdivision servicing bylaws, a property owner makes two applications, one to the Ministry of Transportation and one to us. We can compile our comments, conditions, upon receipt of a formal referral from the Ministry of Transportation and once our review process is done, we supply our comments which are embedded within the preliminary layout approval that the Ministry eventually issues. The preliminary layout approval is the list of conditions. Should you achieve these, you may subdivide. And our conditions are, are noted within, provided they're founded on our bylaws and such. Thank you. Thanks. Director Liu, fine. Director Tice. Yeah, page 236, I, I, saw, I saw that the Gibsons and District Aquatic Facility has about 5,000 visitors in quarter one, and then I looked at um, uh, the uh, Seashell Aquatic Center, and it's uh, roughly about nine times that amount. And I'm, I'm kind of leads me to beg the question as to 
um, you know, looking at costs versus benefit and uh, whether it's in our interest to continue operating that facility. Um, and so ultimately I'd like to see a, a cost-benefit analysis on, on the Indy Gibson's Aquatic Center. Director McMahon? I know this is going to stir, up, but, uh, to stir the pot. The yes. <laughs> yes. Director Ties is opening a can of worms uh, with a real long history. Uh, oh boy, this 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 almost deserves a lunch and learn. Uh, it, it it really does. Uh, personally, I feel that swimming pools are very important um, because they are used or can be used by people of all ages from toddlers to the elderly. They are used for uh, lessons in swimming, which everybody who lives on a coast should know how to swim. And they're therapeutic. Uh, so I think swimming pools are really important. The Gibson's pool is older. It's, it's not the greatest pool. Uh, and so those who can go to Seashell leaving uh, those who need something local uh, to use the local pool. There has been a, a long, long, long discussion about upgrading the Gibson's pool, which uh, I think merits uh, more discussion. Perhaps I should stop there. <laughs> Director Ty, I'll let you respond to that. Yeah, so uh, I'm not opposed to upgrading it and making it a facility that's that's actually useful. Um, uh, I actually haven't been there, but I've talked to many people who have, and you can't swim. Uh, you can't run swim meets because it's only 20 meters long. Uh, it's uh, it's wavy, so you can't really swim lengths um, because you get a mouthful of water every time you go try to do swim a length. Um, so it, it is a fairly um, um, useless pool in, in many in many aspects, but uh, I see the therapeutic use. But uh, you know, I, I just I just wonder. Uh, you know, we we've got uh, pools cost a lot of money, and uh, and, and I think there there may be uh, other ways that we, we can get better better uh, more benefit for the community than continuing to run this old uh, facility. So whether it's an upgrade or whether it's a uh, closure, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's just something I wanted to bring to the table, and, and uh, I know it's going to stir up a hornet's nest, but just my thoughts. Director Seegers. Thank you. I raised that same conversation a few years ago. It was quite interesting. <laughs> a number of, uh, not too long ago, the Gibson's pool was at a state where it needed a lot of work. And it was at the time when the Park, the Parks Master Plan? No, what's well, called here, Recreation and whatever the, I forget the name of the plan that was put together, Recreation and Parks Master Plan or something like that? Yeah. And there was, we actually looked at all the facilities uh, because the return on investment for the Gibson's Pool is very low given the turnout and how many people use it and everything else. Um, there was a, a brief conversation about potentially moving it and adding it onto the um, arena in Gibson's because there would actually be some benefit cost-wise. You already have staff running there, etc. You could, you know, um, heating and cooling, all, where, yeah, all that works together. At the time, the board chose to do the necessary renovations that were required to actually have it be open. Uh, but I, I believe it's a conversation that um, is worthwhile looking at. We have some time now. At that point, it was we didn't actually have the time to really explore it, uh, you know, fully. And I think that is a conversation potentially that we should have as future planning. So what do we look at going forward and how do we um, deal with that? Because I agree, it's an older facility and, I mean, you can keep patching it and keep fixing it, but it's still an old facility and doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the community. It is costly to replace, but it's a conversation we can have. Uh, speaking uh, from Gibson's view, it, one has to remember that that was the facility of the Sunshine Coast at one point in time, and that the the it serviced Seashalt and all the coast as a pool. And um, although it is old, um, I would certainly be in favor of looking at cost benefit with a view 
to what that cost would be to uh, upgrade that pool or replace that pool, uh, but not with a view to shutting the pool down. It is used regularly by, by a number of people in the community. Um, and the swim club does use it as, w as well, although it's not for meets. They do use it for training, and they have advantage of it. And uh, certainly as an asset to our community and to the this part of the lower part of the coast, it's an important asset. Not everybody can go. If you shut it down, um, people would be challenged to get down to Seashell to do it. If you expand it, the numbers in Seashell will probably go down. Uh, use the seashell pool so that, and balance that out sort of thing. But it is an important asset to our community. And uh, I would only favor looking at the cost benefit with a view to uh, how we can upgrade it and how we can expand uh, its use and provide a better experience for people. Director Hills? Um, push the button. Um, yeah, big conversation. Um, um, just looking at the stats, I see that uh, Seashelt numbers actually went down in the first quarter, whereas Gibson's numbers went up. So it's always kind of, you know, an up and down. And I believe as the regional district keeps moving forward with its asset management plan and the cost recovery and recreation which are coming forward, those discussions will come forward in the future. And, um, um, yeah, I, I, I've had enough. <laughs> Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, and staff will probably comment on this. I, I noticed a few places through the report that some of the numbers dropped due to the joint use agreement because they're no longer be count, being counted in the numbers. So I don't know if that impacts uh, the numbers as referred to by Director Hiltz. Any comments, staff, on that? Or? Uh, thank you, Chair Beers. As, uh, as Director Seegers notes, that is a, that is a change uh, a fairly recent change to our how we present uh, statistics and it does have some impact on numbers. Um, staff can uh, continue to meet with the school district to um, share information related to the joint use agreement and ensure that we're doing what we can to best support each other with reporting on the performance of the agreement and staff will look to opportunities to represent that uh, that use of our facilities in, in future reports uh, as we progress on our journey together with the school district. Thanks. Director Hiltz. Uh, a non-aquatic question. <laughs> <laughs> um, although it does relate to water, my, my, uh, it's a two, two questions. One is about the Dakota Ridge and uh, the, the snowpack related to Dakota Ridge and does it kind of factor into the infrastructure services? Does that, is there data collected on snowpack and how Dakota Ridge snowpack is changing over time and does that get moved over to infrastructure services for consideration in the water management? And then the other question is on uh, page 232, which with, with respect to how the Hopkins Wharf was used as a emergency, I, I wouldn't mind a little bit more details about uh, how useful that was as an emergency facility in the ferry evacuation and how the wharf performed in those regards. Staff? Uh, with respect to the snow at Dakota Ridge, there is a report coming forward to infrastructure next week on uh, snow course survey results over the past number of years. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, the specific location is outlined in the report and I don't have it uh, in my mind at the moment, but that will come forward next week and we'll give you more information on the snow surveys. And Hopkins? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Staff are pleased uh, to be able to support transportation resiliency and hopefully make a few, a few folks uh, days less um, stressful by um, uh, coordinating transit services with our port service with, with BC Ferries. And by all accounts, through cooperation of our transit staff and BC Ferries staff, that went that went uh, quite smoothly and helped with passenger ferries for a portion of the day. Thanks. Director Lee. Uh, just an opportunity for me to learn. What's program registrations? <laughs> Staff? Uh, so for our recreation facilities, in addition to drop-in admissions, we uh, 
the, the regional district offers a, a variety of sign-up programs um, that range from Gentle waves, deep water running, aquatic fitness. Um, we have a range of vocational type programs, um, as well as fitness programs, uh, yoga, Pilates, etc. Et and all of those are managed through a registration process, and those numbers are reflected in the reports. Okay. Thank you. Director Lee, follow up. So the admissions reflect the people that attend the programs already then? Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. The numbers as presented uh, I, I apologize, Chair. Staff would like to confirm whether the numbers should be summed to get total attendance at the at the facility or whether program registrations are a subset of the of the larger number. Um, staff will we'll hear back clarify. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Director Lee again. Uh, the reason I was asking is typically program registrations are multiple mm. visits. Visits, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the numbers could be quite different. Thank you. Yeah. Director McMahon. Yes, I just have a comment actually about uh, subdivisions because um, as you know, we have runoff problems from subdivisions in Area E, fairly serious ones. Uh, at the water stewardship conference we were at last week, uh, I discovered that MOTI, in fact, has a manual on best practices for stormwater management. They're simply not following it. So uh, it would behoove us to get a copy of this manual and start uh, holding them to the standards that they are supposed to be building to. So uh, I'll be looking into that, but perhaps staff would like to look into that too because we have a lot of problems with, with how subdivisions are being put in and roads are being built. Thanks. Thank you. Director Pratt. Um, just a couple of com or comment and a question, actually. Um, I'm always intrigued by the Pender Harbor Aquatic uh, Center and their creative programming, everything mm -hmm. from the, the physical literacy piece during Literacy Week and mm -hmm. is, you know, there's a lot of innovative and creative programming there and I'd like to commend them, commend them for that. Uh, regarding Dakota Ridge, uh, do we have... Um, are we able to ascertain the numbers of how many um, residents or visitors there actually um, that actually go to Dakota Ridge during the season, or will that be coming in another further report? Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair Beamish. Staff, uh, staff do record uh, participation at Dakota Ridge. Uh, it's not separated by residents versus non-residents or, or off-coast yeah. visitors. Um, and um, year-end numbers can be reported in a future report. Thank Thanks. You. I have a question, and before Director Ties proposes closing the cemetery, could you exp <laughs> explain why the numbers are going down? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And also, what is the capacity of the cemetery? What's the future of it? On cemeteries. <laughs> uh, now that you mention it. Thank, thank you, Chair <laughs> Beamish. Uh, sta staff would observe that the, the, the level of activity at the cemetery varies quite a bit from quarter to quarter and, <laughs> and year to year. Um, and uh, in terms of capacity, for burials, there is approximately a five-year supply of, of space left. Trends in, uh, in inter interments uh, t are tending away from burials and towards other types of interments, um, which is one of the reasons that um, columbarium niches have been uh, generally more popular in recent years. In, in light of the... Uh, uh, 
the space limitations in the cemetery and the need to plan for the future. There is a standing project in the uh, facility services and parks work plan to complete a cemetery work plan. And that relates not only to Seaview Cemetery, but to the other cemetery properties on, on the coast and with an eye to the, to the future. Uh, and that work is planned for 2019. Hmm. Thank you. Further questions? This report's already been received, so that uh, uh, thank you for report and thank you for your response to our questions and getting back to us on some answers that uh, are left open. Thank you. Thank you. We could move on then now to uh, the next item is the Rural Planning Service uh, Variance Analysis Annex I, and uh, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair Beamish. This report provides context and background for the 2018 year-end variance for the Rural Planning Service. Two factors contributed to a variance for this service, staff allocation and fees and charges. Continued improvements to staff allocation, which means how the time of staff is budgeted against the various service areas that they work in. Uh, continued improvement in that area has taken place in 2019 to more accurately reflect time worked by staff in, in each of the service areas that are overseen by the Planning and Development Division. And that's a process of, Im of improvement that's happening around uh, or across the organization as we have new um, uh, business management uh, tools available. And fees and charges for planning applications and services have not been reviewed for several years and in some cases no longer match the costs of provision. Staff recommend that a review be completed prior to the 2020 budget. And as well, some services such as referral reviews are conducted with no cost recovery and opportunities to streamline processes may exist. So staff recommend that some analysis be undertaken of these opportunities in the context of service planning. Staff will continue to monitor the demand for planning services and budget progress and report to the committee prior to the 2020 budget process. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Any discussion of this report or the recommendations? Director Seegers? Thank you. So as part of that review, you would also look at what we are not charging for now and see if there's um, the ability to actually add those in as well. Mr. Hall? Uh, thank you, Chair. Y yes, that would be in scope of a fees and services review, fees and service charges review. <coughs> thank you. As this concerns rural planning, the rural directors get to vote. So call the uh, uh, move the motion. Um, I'll move the recommendations Dr on page 239. Uh, Director Seeger seconded. Director Hiltz. All in favor? Yeah. See none opposed. That's approved. Thank you. And moving on to Annex J, Agriculture Advisor Committee membership appointment, uh, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Beamish. We have a request from Raquel Koloff, who sits as president of the Southern Sunshine Coast Farmers Institute, to officially join the Agricultural Advisory Committee. She has attended committee for the past two months as an observer and wishes to join and does have support from the Agricultural Advisory Committee as well. We recommend uh, appointment for the remainder of the two-year term, which does expire in October of this year. That will bring a term culmination for all members, and we can reconsider appointments at that time. Thank you. Director McMahon. Yes, I'd like to move that recommendation. Yeah. She's got a farm in my area. Okay. <laughs> and seconded. Um, any discussion? Director Seegers. Thank you. I notice on the um, order paper that it's only indicating rural planning. I, I was under the impression the Agricultural Advisory Committee was actually a coast-wide organization. I know that we have members from Seashelt who sit on there. So um, I'm wondering why the scope is only considered rural. Staff? Thank you, Chair Beamish. And we note um, Director Seeger's comment and agree and note that Agricultural Advisory Committee is a regional service. Okay, thank so we can all we can vote amend. on this. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Director Seegers. So then one other point. Um, I did attend one of the meetings. I haven't attended a lot, but I attended one meeting recently. And there seemed to be an, a belief that the advisory or the Agricultural Advisory Committee was actually going to be winding down, that they were wrapping up. 
in September or October of this year? Is that true or not? What is the, what is the stage it's at? Staff? Yes, thank you, Chair Beamish. When committee members were appointed, they were appointed on a two-year term, which does expire in October of this year. There may have been an inference that that means the committee itself expires. Not necessarily the case. It would continue on pending further board direction. But at that time, staff will prepare a report with recommendations for appointments or committee operations. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hiltz? Uh, follow up to Director Seegers, and yeah, there was a discussion at a meeting I attended, and it was clarified that it is not wrapping up. Yeah, and and, I, and further, I'd just like to thank staff for uh, moving that along quickly and, and allowing uh, uh, Ms. Koloff to be able to participate in, in, in full membership in the committee. It was great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Passes. Thank you. The next items have all been received. Is there any, any of those items that uh, would like to come forward for discussion? This is uh, uh, 14, this is Annex K, L, M, and N. Anyone want to raise any issues from any of those items? Okay. Seeing none, I would like to um, go back to the delegation material that was received earlier on and just have a motion to receive the delegation material that was presented. Moved by Director Seegers. Director Pat, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, we're on now under communications and um, four items of communications there. Um, I don't think they would have been received under our earlier motion. So a motion to receive the four items of communications. Uh, moved, seconded. All in favor of receipt. Any of those items that um, directors would like to discuss specifically? <laughs> Director Ties. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, uh, I, I know that uh, I think the uh, the RCMP building is, is one of those great examples of, of being able to uh, transfer that land um, in Gibsons, I think. For the, yes, correct. Uh, yes. Um, but I'm also wondering if there is an inventory of federal-owned land and buildings uh, on the coast here and whether we're aware of it. Thank you. Yeah. Staff? Thank you, Chair. Staff are not aware of such an inventory um, no. or, and, or haven't been ama made a aware of such an inventory. Director Hills? Uh, yes, further, further to um, Director Ties, it does seem odd that the federal government is asking if we have some of their land in our jurisdiction. It just seems to be kind <laughs> of a bit of a mess there. Director Seegers? Thank you. I think they're just wanting us to be aware that yeah. if we do have land, opportunity. Yeah. there are opportunities mm -hmm. available. We actually have done a, a scan in Seashot, and the only land that we have is around the airport at this point. Uh, but um, one of the staff members mentioned that, you know, there were old post offices, for example, mm -hmm. that, you know, are no longer being used, and so some of that was federal land. So it'd be something to look at to see whether or not mm -hmm. there is any federal land that's available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be some opportunities for projects. Is that something we'd like to wish staff to do over this uh, period of time? or Yes, but I don't were? know if I can make a recommendation because it's probably a rural yeah. function. Director Tyes, would you like to make that recommendation? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a re uh, recommendation just for staff to have a look at uh, federal property uh, in within the rural areas and uh, see if uh, any of them are no longer in use and, and, and could be uh, used uh, for our purposes. Yep. Uh, somebody choose to second that? Seconded? You might get more wharfs. Oh. <laughs> or cemetery. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, all, uh, all, all in favor of the uh, motion? Yeah. Okay. Approved. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any rush on that, but it'd be interesting to know. And I, I don't believe Gibson's has anything other th other than the uh, continued ownership of portions of the work down there by the federal government. Yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, other items there for discussion? Director McMahon? Yes, I see the message there from the District of Highland Council challenging us to a climate challenge. I did go online and, and take the the survey, the questionnaire, whatever it was, uh, the footprint calculator. I, I have to say, I, I don't think it's the most useful thing in the world. 
Um, I, it's, it's pretty subjective. It's, I would question some of the measurements involved, but it, it again is aimed at changing individual behavior, and I really think that we need to be focused on a much bigger picture than that. So I don't really support that. I believe we'll hear more about that this next couple of days at ABICC as well. So, so. Any comment on item 21, uh, Derek McMahon? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I am trying to figure out how to go forward with Block 1313 because uh, despite many attempts from various folks to explain our legal situation there, I, I really don't thoroughly understand it. Uh, I don't... Um, yeah, I don't understand the legal situation of the land. I don't know what the options are. I do know that we have been, it's been suggested we go to the minister, but I don't know what we're asking the minister for. So I, I am in a state of confusion. I, I want to move this forward. There's interest in the community about creating uh, an educational forest. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I don't know how we do it. I, I, I'm, I'm multiply puzzled by this. I went on the, our, our mapping um, thing for the SCRD, and I discovered that there are watershed tenures. One of them is, is within Block 1313. Well, apparently, it doesn't mean anything because, I mean, we have a watershed tenure for, I believe it's the town of Gibson's holds it. Uh, but if we have no control over what happens on that land, what on earth is the point of having a tenure? I, I am... This is, I'm having a lot of trouble with this one. So I, I need some help. The community is, is eager to get involved in an in educational forest proposal. Whoever led the show, it might not be the SCRD. It might, there might be a more suitable uh, nonprofit or charitable organization to lead, the, lead this. Um, but I do need to really understand what our next steps are in terms of, of uh, securing the property. Director Pratt? Okay, I will... I'm not quite sure exactly what our next steps are, but I can tell you I've, um, I've had a brief face-to-face -face with Minister Donaldson with um, actually a request from him to meet um, the next time he's up in Pearl River. So that'll be coming up soon. Um, we're just arranging that with our MLA. Um, I also, when I was at uh, the Council of Forest Industry Conference last week, I had a conversation with um, the manager for uh, BCTS for the Chinook area, which is what we're part of, and, um, and he's committed to meeting again and putting us in contact with their public consultation piece as well. So there's, so we're building on those next steps. So, um, uh, so w it, uh, the meetings, like the brief face-to-faces I had last week were very, very valuable, including an engineered meeting with the Premier, which was kind of fun. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Chair Beamish and I can talk about that later. It was mm. quite humorous. Um, but uh, it was, uh, we've, We've had some some starting conversation on it, and um, and Minister Donaldson has 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 said that he wants more conversation with us, which is great. Um, and BCTS, is, uh, the BC Timber Sales, has um, has said that they're willing to have more conversation as well. Um, so I would my my sense is. Uh, and from the letter from Minister Donaldson is also is to continue on that conversation piece. Um, also, I started developing a, um, a, a relationship with the Deputy Minister while we, I was away last week too, and getting into his space as well, so that uh, we can have continued conversation and. Um, and uh, actually have a conference call with an assistant deputy minister within the ministry mm -hmm. later today, uh, Craig Sutherland. And, and um, I'm not sure if this will be one of the things we talk about, but um, it can certainly be maybe a piece that might end up on the agenda as well. Um, so I'm, I'm a little, 
I'm not sure exactly because we also we have uh, uh, two First Nations within our area that both have interests in this area as well, and um, so we we need to have those mm -hmm. conversations. So I think um, there's there's a lot going on, and I'm trying to uh, trying to bring all of those pieces together, and um, I'm not actually sure what the next steps are. Um, so my, um, my thought is to continue the conversation with BCTS, maybe actually ask them to come up for a presentation. I know they've done that in the, the past, um, and, um, and they certainly seemed open to that um, when I met with the manager last week. And so that's, I think, um, I think the next step is just conversation. I'm just not sure how quickly it'll happen. Director Tides? Yeah, I, um, I also had some conversations with some representatives from ELF, and, um, and they're truly gutted by um, Clack Creek being put on the auction block. Uh, and uh, in further conversation, you know, the, essentially Clack Creek is sort of the last remaining link between some of the uh, old growth area in the proposed park to the east and to uh, to the area to the west, and so their belief is is that you know really, once Clack Creek is is logged, there's really not much left to save, um, and uh, and that it, so it, to them it is incumbent that Clack Creek it does not get logged, um, and I, I said to them is that look if. If, if there's anything that, uh, that, that we can do as a, as a board at this point, you know, we've voiced our objection, we've done this, um, that, they, that they should come and, as a delegation and, and uh, present their, their, um, their rationale again because they're the experts. Um, but um, uh, at, at this point, uh, I feel like we, we've done uh, as much as we can do. Um, if there's a desire around the board that we get another delegation to explain the importance of Clack Creek, um, on on their their note, they're they're thinking of um, uh, starting litigation, and um, so that's um, that's just my little report from Elf at this point. Well, I have Director Pratt, Director Hiltz, and Director Lee, and I'm going to go first to Director Pratt. Um, just regarding Clack Creek, um, my understanding is Clack Creek may have already gone out for auction yeah. last week. I know. Yeah, so um, that's I. I don't know what we do beyond that. Yeah. So I, it, the the axe may have already fallen, mm -hmm. so to speak. And Director Hiltz, uh, follow up to uh, Director Pratt. The the potential for forestry to kind of have some resources to do public consultation engagement on the ground is that kind of you were hearing that they might be willing to commit something to, to that? Potentially. Um, there, there seems to um, – I'm not sure about how, how I'm going to say fulsome <laughs> their consultation process will be. Um, but definitely with us, I think if we – we could probably leave the boat in this. I'll um, – and speak to our own and do our own consultation process in concert with them, and I would rather t I would like to see us take the leadership in that con uh, that consultation process because there's a lot of uh, a lot of competing interests. We have um, we're the rep we're the locally elected representatives, and um, I frankly for um, for the leadership and for the betterment of our community, I think there needs to be. Uh, it needs to be done locally rather than provincially um, or by a provincial arm. But I think it's it's necessary to have those uh, those conversations with them and hear what their, like for example with BCTS, what their community engagement piece is about. Um, and uh, in regards to the province, I think this letter effectively says, you know, SCRD and BCTS, you work it out and let us know. Um, that's reading between the lines, but um, I mean – until we have further clarification or meetings with BCTS, there's I think there's a big opening here um, to building some kind of bridge and 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 having all of our voices heard. That's my sense. Director Lee, I 
think the uh, discussion we're having is is in reality around um, land use planning and the lack of land use planning uh, for Crown land. It's uh, the same issue we're seeing here is the same issue we saw for the foreshore in uh, Pender Harbor. And the the message has got to be that it's it's within our area. They say they put the put the line around it, and so we should be doing land use planning uh, as the responsibility had been given to us, whether it's crown land or private land, because all land is actually crown land. Some is just given to us as long as we pay tax. So the conversation. I'm not saying. This should be a park and this shouldn't. That's something that uh, we do when we set land use plans like we do with the OCP. We have a big community discussion about the best use for that land. And then we zone it and then we put bylaws in place to plan it. And that needs to happen with this. And I think you have to have a two-way discussion because the government is probably <laughs> the one that could tell us how best to achieve our goals, they know. You know, we don't know how best to achieve our goals, but I'll tell you, they know. I'm pretty sure they would. And if not, our staff would know if we'd give them enough time to look at it and make recommendations for us. Um, so there's a lot of competition for the resources, and uh, I'm a very strong supporter of community force and uh, give the government their revenue, but... Uh, their, their stumpage, but let's us keep the revenue here, and uh, perhaps that's a good use. I don't know enough to even comment on a corridor between uh, two parks. I've read quite a bit about corridors between two parks. I'm not sure the clear cut isn't the best corridor to have between the two refuges, but again, we need an expert to tell us. And so that's my thoughts on the whole thing. We need to push them from the land use plan. And if, if we're convinced that the logging sales that they're proposing are going to stop us from being able to land use plan in the near future, perhaps we should say, no, we don't like that because we want to have this conversation first. So that's my thought. By the way, I'm a strong proponent of um, professional foresters telling us what's best for the land because mm -hmm. they do know. Thanks. Director Seegers and Director McMahon. Thank you. Um, I know in the District of Seashelt, we are engaging with the province and the Seashelt Nation because the province is going to be working with the Seashelt Nation to do a land use plan for the whole area. I don't know what the, the engagement that they're looking to do with the Squamish Nation, but that is something else that would need to be factored into um, any deliberations or any consultation for that area um, you know, it, as it is in the Squamish territory. Director McMahon. Of course I agree. We need a much better uh, public engagement strategy over all of this and more planning. In regards to Block 1313, which is in a number of ways an anomalous situation, uh, the residents have been living with chronic uncertainty since 2013, and we keep being in a reactive situation. So I would really like it if we had a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. At least it would give us a roadmap of what direction we're going in rather than saying, oh, well, we'll have to talk to somebody and then the next year rolls around and then it comes up for auction again and then everybody leaps up and protests. I mean, this is, this is crazy, the, the way this has been continuing. So uh, I would like to see some kind of proactive way forward that we can work towards. Director Ties, do you have your hand up? Um, yeah. yeah, I guess. Um, <laughs> I forgot to mention that, um, uh, that uh, you know, uh, ELF was also uh, quite uh, concerned as to what uh, the First Nation, uh, First Nation's interests are in the uh, in the, in the proposed park, uh, Elphinstone Park, and, um, and, and that is what is making them hesitate to, um, uh, to pursue litigation at this point because they, uh, they, they certainly uh, want to respect and, uh, and, um, and, and listen to what the, the First Nations have to say uh, around this area. Um, 
so that that was something that I uh, for, forgot to mention, and um, I'll be talking in, in my director's report more about First Nations uh, uh, engagements. Thank you. Director Sears. Thank you. I'd like to commend um, Chair Pratt for all the work that she's been doing in focusing on this. I think she's made amazing headway in the last while. Um, and I think, I know we, we want to see some kind of resolution. It's been a, a long time, but I think she's pushing forward quickly and getting results. So I think we should give her a little more time to get some of these things addressed. I think she'll come back to the board with some recommended ways forward. Director Pratt. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will say on a, on a funny note, um, when I met Minister Donaldson this past weekend, or last week, I have no idea what day I did. Um, he, when I introduced myself, he's like, oh, he's like, I, I, he's like, I have a friend named Lori Pratt, so every time a letter from, signed by you comes across my desk, I take note of it because I'm not sure if it's you or her. So we'll, let's use that. <laughs> um, but I do actually have a draft motion that I like to read. Um, that the chair work with staff to draft a uh, consulta consultation process in regards to the Reed Road TSL. And the, the Reed Road TSL, that's how it's referred to, which essentially 13, is the blo 13. block 1313 yeah. and that yeah. area. And come back to the board. Um, I'm thinking of timeline. Um, what's reasonable um, it to uh, the May um, uh, the May planning and committee uh, planning C FPCD yep. committee okay. meeting okay it's a um, motion to is that it was that clear I'm sorry yeah the chair work with staff to come up with a strategy re regarding consultation the process. yeah consultation process for DL 1313 yeah. And seconded by Director McMahon. Uh, Director Lee. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering in that motion if we should say who we're going to consult with. I would assume it would say government, uh, First Nations. I think that would be part of the strategy, part of the plan to come forward is who, they, who would be involved in the consultation. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, on that motion, Director Pratt. Um, I would be happy to add um, and uh, indicate stakeholders. Okay. As as an amendment. Okay. Um, friendly amendment. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> we have a motion. We have a, a motion to amend the motion by the mover, and seconded by Director Lee. So all in favor of the amendment of the motion. Um, Okay, now on the main motion, uh, all in favor on the main motion as amended. Oh, before we go, I yeah. just wanted. You want to amend or it before, again? No, no, no. I'm not going <laughs> to amend. I'm not going to amend an amended motion. Mm -hmm. I just want to look to staff and see if there's any further um, clarity around that that they need, or if that's if that's enough to just to move forward with um, some thoughts. I'm I'm prepared to roll up my sleeves on this and uh, and do whatever needs to be done as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hall. Um, uh, staff feel that's enough to get yeah, started. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And did we did we vote on that? Do we all approve? Okay. All in favor. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to comment uh, from the other perspective, and that is that um, we are fighting these battles incrementally, and we're not doing it as part of a strategy. And I take uh, Mr. Lee's, Director Lee's point that we need to look much broader. We need to have a community, uh, a regional response, um, and, and, and both engage with our partners, the uh, First Nations, uh, both First Nations on the coast as well as the province, as well as the private uh, landowners and, and the uh, private operators, and uh, see where we come out to. And I think we need to do that uh, as part of our idea for regional land use planning, but maybe we simply have to look at a regional forestry planning as, as a step in that process because I know there's, 
interest in, in expanding the concept of the community force to include uh, C. Schult and the regional district and the town of Gibsons, but we don't have a strategy to, to do that. We don't have a strategy to have that conversation. And I think we need to look at developing. Now that could come out of our strategic plan as kind of a first action item. And, um, but I'll go now to Director Seegers. I don't think I want to say anything on that at this point. Sorry. Well, it, w it is a conversation that's going to happen. Yes. That's all I'm okay. Say. Well, I think it's, it's something we need to bear in our minds that because the next lot that comes up for sale, we're going to be back at the same place and saying with opposition and with, uh, with discussion, and we don't have a plan per se. And I think we need to do that. And that's why I think the province is very hard to engage with them as well. It's much easier if we're referring to a strategy that we have and saying our strategy is this. How do you guys fit in with our strategy? So, so if we could work in that direction. So, um, to no more discussion on that issue. Uh, we'll go to new business, and that's public engagement on water. Director Seegers. Thank you. The reason I'm bringing this forward is uh, we've, we actually have been taking steps at this board to deal with our water situation. The newspapers, both representatives here, the radio have been very good about getting information out. I mean, I've seen, as we've all seen, lots of articles in the paper, lots on the radio. Um, but then I go out into the community and they have no idea what we're doing. Um, if you look at the Coast Reporter from last Friday, I think there were four letters in there saying, well, are you guys going to do something about water? So the information is not getting out to the community. We have been told that the snowpack is 23% below average on one and 17% below average on the other and of the lakes. Um, if we had, if the community had followed the stages in 2018, we would not have gone to stage four. So um, I know staff feel that they do not have the capacity right now to do some public engagement this spring, but I think as a board we indicated that we want it to happen. So I would like to put forward a recommendation that we engage a consultant uh, to do public engagement regarding water in May of 2019 and that we set aside a budget of up to $20,000. And I look for a seconder. Motion, uh, we have a seconder for that motion. Chair, uh, Director McMahon, second it. Discussion? One of the things that uh, came up at the water conference that uh, some of us attended last week, uh, very impressed with the work that Nanaimo is doing. And this is one of their articles here. It's a, called State of the Aquifers 2017. But this is one of the reports that they actually put out. And they, they are, seem to have a very good handle. They're working now on the next 10-year plan uh, for their watershed. And, um, and providing this kind of information to the community on a, on a annual basis. And I think it's very useful to, to be able to do that. And uh, so I did talk to um, our administrator about inviting the, um, the, the planner who's involved with water from the regional district to the coast to talk to us about what they do over there. And, um, and she was extremely enthusiastic, extremely well organized. Um, Julie Passani, Passani is her name, and uh, it's very, very good uh, presentation. She's the, the coordinator for the regional district in Nanaimo for watershed uh, protection. And uh, having that as a, a start of conversation could, could be something as well. Director Seegers. Thank you. And I'd like to clarify with staff that if it's under $30,000 that we do not have to go to RFP. I'm given considering the timeline here. Um, so we could actually just go out and find out who that who does government consultation and is available and actually get this moving quickly. So I'd look for a clarification on that. So any further discussion on the question, on the uh, resolution? Director Hiltz? Yeah, I'm just looking at the pot of money that it's going to come out of, right? That's, so that's a, a question to staff of availability. Staff, any ideas on uh, budget for that? Well, according to the Local Government Act, the cost of a service is borne by the service, so it would have to come from within regional water, and I can't speak to the availability of funds, but um, that's where the money would have to come from. Um, staff also want to note that there is a report coming forward at next week's Infrastructure Services Committee 
on uh, proposed updates to the drought management plan in response to the requests from the board. Um, coming out of that, once decisions are made on the drought management plan, we also have a plan for an updated communications plan coming forward to the corporate services meeting at the end of the month. So timing wise uh, is very tight if we want uh, we could still do public engagement in May but it may be helpful to wait until we have more information on the drought management plan so we can have a broader and targeted engagement plan not just on the water supply projects but also tying in the drought management plan um, to be able to make the best use of resources. Director Seegers. Thank you. That information can inform the uh, consultant and can be included. I don't want to wait until we get more information. There's always going to be more information coming forward. If we don't get in front of this this spring, we're going to have a very bad situation this summer. Um, and one of the conversations that we've had among the directors just informally is around what happens if we run out of water. We don't have any plans. That's not a conversation that's happened. We need to get the community on board behind us to buy into these drought, you know, these conservation stages, right, which is what I would prefer seeing them called. Uh, mm -hmm. But if, if we, because if we don't, and if we don't get in front of this, I don't know what this summer is going to look like. Yeah, I'm aware as well that uh, in the month of May, our uh, town of Gibsons is going to be doing some public uh, awareness on water. And uh, uh, BC Water Wastewater Association, uh, first week in May is uh, is Water Week, and we'll be working with that and doing some public comp public information. Also, I know that our administrator is talking to staff here about how uh, the town of Gibsons can help mitigate uh, water problems in the regional district if we are pushed in that direction this year, that uh, how we can move water from the, uh, the Gibsons aquifer into the uh, regional district uh, to supplement the water supply. So, so that uh, whether it's a valve switch or whether it's a new valve or what needs to be done in that, uh, in that regard to turn the water in the other direction. So, so that uh, we, are, we are looking at that uh, as well at the staff level. But we have a motion on the table, and uh, it's been moved and seconded. Um, the uh, initial report from staff will come back with an actual budget item and uh, then given some parameters so that uh, if we could um, vote on that, all in favor of that motion? Okay. No, no opposed, so move that one forward. Let's sorry. leave that one still. Oh, sorry, Director Hiltz. Yeah, I didn't get that. Um, I am opposed. I, I'm, you are opposed. I'm, I'm more yeah. a, a week okay. to get the information, and yeah. I, I don't feel confident in what the budget items are. I, I feel I need information about from the from the financial point of view and yeah. uh, and, and more consideration. So that's, that's, okay. that's my opposition. And I think that could be part of the coming back and saying how it could be done and at what cost. So, so that uh, okay. Um, anything further on that? Um, we um, have an in-camera session uh, coming up following this, and uh, the um, resolution the public be excluded from attendance of the meeting in accordance with Section 91C of the Community Charter, Labor Relations, or other, or other employee relations. Somebody move that? Move, seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn this meeting. Okay. Uh, move, seconded. Oh, we don't adjourn. Okay, we can, we're going to come back. Okay, so well, before we before we then uh, close for in camera, do we have questions? Uh, media, thank you, Connie. Up to twenty thousand dollars.